verse 16. An interesting verse, and as I said, I, I deliberately look for something like this to preach on at this time of year when there is so much misinformation going around. We need to have Christ clearly set before us in all his beauty and splendor. I want to talk then on the mystery of godliness this morning. The mystery of godliness. It was some years ago, but I remember driving to Scotland, and as you do in the car, listening to the radio. Um, radio 4 it would be as I was going up, or perhaps Radio Scotland, which is very similar. And it was about this time of year. And one of the news stories that came on was that the baby Jesus had gone missing. Somebody had set out a nativity scene, and the doll had been hijacked. And of course the whole community was up in arms. How could they celebrate the season of the year without that image to guide them? It caused me to chuckle. Because of course nobody knows what Jesus looked like. And to have anything to represent him is, I believe, one of the grievous mistakes of our world and society. And while we might chuckle about the nativity scene, let's ask the question whether in fact the man Jesus is missing from our lives. Whether in fact he is in our lives as Lord and Saviour. This passage intrigued me. I was drawn to verse 16 as I prayed about it. And then as I studied the passage, I was intrigued at the context You'll have noticed it begins by talking about bishops. By the way, that's a mistranslation caused by James I way back in the 17th century. The word is overseer, and it's the same as an elder. But you get that description of the church leader, and then those folks that assist them, the deacons. And then you come right down to a description of the church and its function. And as I've prayerfully studied it, it strikes me, the reason this passage is at the end of that section is that it's the church's function to reveal the glorious Lord Jesus Christ to the world that we live in. And I'm persuaded that's exactly what we will see as we go through these passages. The Lord Jesus did come in the form of a child, but when he comes a second time, he will be unveiled in glory and splendor and majesty. And I'd much rather focus and concentrate on that than to be stuck in the past. And so this morning I want to cover this passage under three headings. Jesus, man and saviour. Jesus, seen and proclaimed. Jesus, working and waiting. We'll go through the passage, and I think the statements in the passage are in pairs, and that's why I've put them together as I have. Remember, the apostle is writing to Timothy, who's leading the church in Ephesus at this time, and he's giving him instructions on the church's nature, function, and purpose. And as he has laid out the position of elders and deacons, he now comes right down to everybody else. But that would include the elders and deacons, for we are the church together. As soon as you're born again of God's Spirit, you're part of the universal church. The universal church then shows itself in local churches. And each local church has that calling to be a lighthouse on the edge of eternity in the community where it's placed. What is the light that is to shine? No, step back. Who is the light that is to shine? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's the test of our whole purpose and function as a congregation. Are we shining the light of Jesus Christ into the world that we live in, our personal world and our public world? Oh, that God would help us today to see that our the supreme focus is to be upon the God who was manifested in the flesh 
and justified in the Spirit. I think those two words bring together the whole life of Christ on this planet. They're a reminder that he lived, died, and rose again. And that he himself is therefore our greatest encouragement to godly living. It's understanding who he is that helps us make the choices which decide who we are. It's understanding what he's done and how it's significant today that enables us to walk in fellowship with him here on this earth. I've written down, God came right down into our world to lift us up into his. God came right down into our world to lift us up into his. And if you just remember the first two lines of this, this um, refrain, many people think it, it's an ancient hymn, and that's why modern versions have it in the poetic format in the passage. That this would have been something the early church sang when they gathered together. It is just an opinion, but it does seem to have some merit. Christian living then finds its power and incentive in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Bible calls us not only to believe in him, but to imitate him. You remember the words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me. But he doesn't stop there. Just as, and perhaps only as, I imitate Christ. That's my calling. That's your calling. Ephesians 5, 1, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Beloved, writes John in 3 John 11, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, and he who does evil, listen, has not seen God. The eye of faith sees God in the scriptures. God manifest in the flesh God unveiled it's no surprise then that the first part of the verse actually says without controversy great is the mystery of godliness without controversy it's undeniable the fact that Jesus Christ truly did enter in to the virgin's womb truly was born as a real baby, truly did grow up as a young man and work with his father as a carpenter. <coughs> and then after his baptism, step out into the world to, to declare the kingdom of God and to call men and women to repentance and faith without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. There have been books upon books written trying to explain that and that perhaps encourages us to realize just how great this mystery is. The word mystery in the Bible is always, well, I should say, the word mystery in the New Testament is always used in a specific manner and that is something that was once hidden but has now been revealed. If you even notice earlier in the passage, this is in verse 9, talking about deacons, sometimes we think deacons don't need to be really spiritually aware, but talking about deacons, it says, holding the mystery of the faith with a good conscience. Every believer is, in, is brought into the light of that mystery. Once it was complete just information to you. But by God's grace, it has now become the means of your transformation. God's word changed from just ink on a paper to the living voice of God in my heart. Flee from the wrath to come. Flee to Christ. Enjoy forgiveness, both now and forevermore. That's the mystery of faith. 
The simplest Christian is better taught than the greatest theologian who has not yet experienced that grace. How do I know? When Nicodemus came to Jesus, he was the teacher in Israel. Top man in their theology. And Jesus floored him, didn't he? Unless you're born again. You cannot see. Oh, but Nicodemus says, what do you mean? Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter. There is a threshold here which every true believer passes through. When Jesus Christ is no longer just a word that is in fact revealed to your heart and your mind as God himself. Speaking to the disciples, Jesus says in Mark's Gospel, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. To you. Understand the privilege then. Great is the mystery of godliness. The word godliness is very simple. God-likeness. It's just our English language conflates that into a nice easy word with which we are familiar. And the mystery of godliness then, and this is where this verse intrigued me, is that you get ordinary people born of God's spirit who are now living to please God. The overseers need to be, the deacons need to be, look at the conduct, look at the verse, if I am delayed, I write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The mystery of living to please and be like the Savior is incredible. Hard to get your head around. No, more than that. Unknown <coughs> by any except those who have been born of God's Spirit. That's why you're here this morning. That's why the unbeliever's not here. They have no real understanding of who God is, what God has done, and how that affects the way we live and the choices that we make. What is this mystery of godliness? It begins with Christ, God. Some modern versions have he. It's a textual um, debate. I'm sticking with God. God was manifest in the flesh. Remember, God is spirit. Has no parts or passions, the theologians tell us. And that means that before Jesus Christ came to dwell with us on this planet, he was a spirit. No shape or form. Eternal second person of the Trinity. And the wonder and the mouth dropping mystery is that he became one of us. No, the mystery is greater than that, isn't it? That he so loved us that he became one. The righteous God was well within his rights to condemn the failed experiment of Adam and Eve. But he didn't. He knew beforehand how they would stumble and fall. And he had prepared beforehand the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It was God's plan, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. And then in due time, he was born of a woman under the law. That he might save the likes of you and me. And I think the real power of Christian living comes from wrestling with this. I nearly said understanding it. I've been at this for 50 years, and I still don't fully understand it. But it comes with wrestling with us. When you, when you have choices to make, when you have decisions to make, you need at times help to stand back and say, is it pleasing to God? The God who loved me and gave himself me. The God who willingly laid all his glory aside, didn't think it was something to be held on to. Humbled himself, took the form of a man, a servant, took the shape of the cross 
died for us. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So right here at the beginning at this, of this sermon, you and I are summoned to focus in on Jesus Christ in his glory and splendor as the power and incentive to function as a church, yes. But before the church functions, you need to function as a believer. Churches are made up of believers. And that's the one criteria for membership, is it not? He came here, you see, friends, lived a real life. He was justified in the spirit. That word justified means declared right, declared righteous. Some people like to break it down to just as if I died. And it reminds us that that justification in the spirit was manifest in his life as a sacrifice for our sin. And as we look at Jesus, you and I are not only to, to, to have our jaw drop in awe, we, are, we, we need our hearts to beat in, in delight. That's the thing the Bible describes as joy. A joy you can have when even everything around you is miserable. He loved me. He gave himself. Pardon? For who? For me. I'm thrilled that God loved the world. I'm even more thrilled that God has any time for this old bag of bones and water. <coughs> he was justified by the Spirit all the way through his life. He walked in subjection to God by the Spirit. And because he lived that perfect life, he could go to Calvary and die that substitutionary death. Not as a criminal, but as the Lamb of God who was taking away the sins of the world. And then you have these words in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, where it says he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness, justified by the Spirit. Till that moment, you see, Jesus could well have just been another Jewish would-be Messiah. Oh yes, he might have died a spectacular death. But it was his resurrection which sealed forever the truth that this one truly was God's servant. Yea, was God himself serving us. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Who is he serving? His Father, yes. Your will be done, not mine, but you and me. And it was done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we have the record before us from the scriptures that Jesus' resurrection sealed forever the wonder of who he is. Oh, dear friends, a new thing has happened. There is a man in the heavens. He has ascended on high. He sits at the Father's right hand where he is passionately concerned for the welfare of his people. He's building his church and knows all about Satan's mischief and will thwart it. You and I need to grapple with that because these are strange days for Christianity. It should not be as weak and, 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 and I don't know what the next word is, weak and powerless as it is. And so we need to go back and like the psalmist says, cry out, restore us, O Lord, cause your face to shine. This gospel has not changed. The, the words that D.L. Moody preached are the same words that we attempt to preach. And don't stop with Moody. Go backwards, Whitfield, Wesley, the Reformation. 
What brought these things about? It was, it was telling the world about the wonder of who Jesus is. And that then becomes, I was trying to remember the, the French phrase, the reason for our existence. Some of you, especially Peter, will help me later, I'm sure. Raison d'etre. That's the word. I couldn't quite get that in my head. <laughs> the reason for our existence is to help the world see that we have an incredible Savior. You don't have to win the argument. You just need to be ready to say it. And the opportunity arises. He is our saviour. He came for the purpose of telling the world. And he's left that job with us. I, I, I read an illustration years ago, and it, I've probably told you a number of times, because it just never gets out of my head, that when the Lord ascended to glory, the angels were commending him on, on the great work that he had done in redemption and resurrection. And then they just quietly, as you would, said, but what, what arrangements have you made for the future? I've left 11 men behind and a handful of women. And boy, did they know the power of God in their lives. They turned the world upside down. It keeps on struggling to reassert itself, though, doesn't it? It's my calling. It's your calling as Christians. With the gifts and opportunities and the person that you are. To do your little bit to turn the world upside down by telling them the wonder of this beautiful saviour the wonder of this great god and king who definitely deliberately came here on earth i came across a hymn and i'll read you the words i love your kingdom lord the house of your abode the church our blessed redeemer saved with his own precious blood I love your church, O oh God, her walls before you stand, dear as the apple of your eye engraven on your hand. Behold my highest joy, I prize her heavenly ways, her sweet communion, solemn vows, her hymns of love and praise. Sure as the truth shall last, to Zion shall be given the brightest glories earth can yield and brighter bliss of heaven, written by a man called Timothy Dwight, who was Jonathan Edwards' grandson or son-in-law, one of those two. When you understand how much Christ loves the church, you then begin, and again, even all these years, I'm only beginning to understand his, his, his gracious purpose to present himself in bodily form, your body and mine, to the world that we live in. What an honour. What a privilege. He loved this church. He gave himself. And that's the pattern for the church. And perhaps we need to ask unbelievers to forgive us. Perhaps we need to go back and say we're sorry for grumbling. We're sorry for not persisting. We're sorry that we, we've given you any excuse for not believing in Christ. And help us to prayerfully lead you to him. You see, the gospel, the news of Christ, is to be, is to be shared with all mankind. Where do I get such an idea? The next two lines, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles. Seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles. Those two lines encompass all that God has created. And the purpose of God has always been for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. How do I know? His last words, go! Make disciples, preach the gospel. And here's just a nice helpful reminder as we contemplate the beauty and the majesty and the wonder of Christ. This is quite a strange phenomenon. I think it was Bunyan who said, and I'm not going to quote Pilgrim's Progress, don't panic. 
The, the, the gospel is something that becomes greater the more you give it away. The more you share it, the more wonderful it becomes to you. Because you begin to see its impact on the world around you. It's the reason I believe the church is still here, weak and struggling as she might appear to be. I believe earnestly God has not finished saving people. Because if he had finished saving people, I'd be listening to a trumpet. And my saviour would be set descending on the clouds. The reason that, that the church continues in our fallen, broken world is that he has a people to save. Not only in China and Africa and South America, but right back down here in Pickering, Middleton. <coughs> it's quite remarkable. Paul Arnold was helping me yesterday and tell the truth when we were talking at lunchtime it was quite depressing. We were reflecting on the condition of various churches that he's familiar with on the East Coast and you know every one of them seems to be just ready to be blown away by a strong gust of wind. And it would be possible to descend into a spiral of despair except, except God's not finished saving men and women yet. God's still got lost sinners to take on his shoulders and carry home rejoicing. It's what makes me get back up here week after week. That's my business here below. The name writer beat me to that, to that phrase. To cry, to cry, behold, behold the Lamb. That's, dear friend, your business. And that's why this passage is here, you see. There was a day when the invisible second person of the Trinity became a man. He announced it to, to Mary through Gabriel. And she was so excited that she has that phrase, that passage in Luke chapter 2, we call the Magnificat. The way I want to get your mind is those shepherds in the fields watching the flocks and an angel tells them get down to Bethlehem for there's born to you this day in the city of David a, a saviour who is Christ the Lord you know what comes next the angels can't keep quiet they're watching something which is phenomenally astounding and there's a whole host singing glory to God in the highest Peace on earth among men. That's gospel. That's the purpose of the incarnation. Seen by angels. There was no saviour for angels. A third of them fell. And they'll be shut out of God's presence forever. Man is, 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 is God's special creation. And although he deserves to be shut out of God's presence forever, it pleased God to come here to save them personally. No wonder the angels watched. They were right there at the tomb, remember? Mary and others going to, to, to embalm a corpse and there's an angel sitting on the stone. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. What does he say next? He is risen. That was the angels. And you can go right through your New Testament and you'll find time after time that the angels were, were, were thrilled and excited by the fact that Christ had come. And as I read that, I'm thinking, does it give me a buzz? Did once. And has at various times. But it does seem to sort of leak, doesn't it? So we get back to the ordinary as if it's all there is. The angels are still worshipping and praising God right now in eternity. Where the saints are casting their crowns, there's a, a multitude of angels worshipping continually. 
And when he comes back, yes, the saints are coming with him, but the angels are too. Because they personally understand the wonder of who he is. Chrysostom, one of what are called the church fathers, said, Angels with us saw the Son of God, not having seen him before. Or another one of these men. For the invisible nature of the Godhead, not even they had seen, but saw him when he became flesh. And so when he says he is seen by angels, he's taking you right back to the Incarnation. How do I say it? The world wants to just stay there. They want a baby Jesus they can put in a manger, bring him out for the few days of Advent, and then somewhere in January stick him back in the cupboard again. It really is... I need to be gentle, don't I? It really is wrong. Because that baby grew up to be a real boy, a real man. And as a real man, he spoke words of light and life to a dying world. Which resulted in the kingdom of God being established. He was a preacher. And as a preacher, he passed on that great message. He was not only a preacher. He died on that cross and commissioned the taking of that message to the ends of the earth. I keep coming up across Christians who want to tell me we're really close to the second coming and they'll list all the different signs that they imagine mean that it's going to happen yesterday. I'd have no trouble with it if it happened before today was out, even missing our, our carol service. That would be the most glorious thing, like, like Mr. Moody. Don't let anybody ever think, tell you that dying means the end. Dying is promotion. But he gave us the honour and the privilege of having that message preached to the world. Now, not everybody is a preacher. The word for preacher here is caruso, which means a herald. We have that tradition in England, don't we? The man with the bell and the red suit. Is it a red suit? Something is blue. And you know what happens. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And everybody's supposed to turn and listen. That's what he's talking about here. We have a message to be pronounced and announced to the world in our buildings, in our streets, in our communities. And it's a message about the God who became man to save us from our sin. Don't apologize for it. The message of the cross is only foolishness to those who are perishing. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And it will be the power of God to everyone for whom Christ died. And they'll be drawn with it. But it is intriguing that that was God's plan from eternity. Not only that the, the, the Jewish people should come to faith. But the Gentiles should be gathered in to the kingdom of God. Romans 15 quotes Isaiah chapter 11. There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall raise, sorry, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. It's an exercise in the Old Testament to find the word Gentiles. It's not always for judgment. The seed of Abraham was to be a blessing to the whole world. And so when the writer here includes the Gentiles, he's reminding us. That the church exists for one reason. And that is to show the power of the gospel in the life of the saints. And through the saints to bring that gospel to a dying world. There are some copies of the Christmas E.T. there. Twenty of them I think. Why not take two home with you and put one through each of your neighbour's doors. <coughs> You see, it's as simple as that. 
You may not be a preacher, you may not be able to go out and face the world, but you can and do pray. Pray for the advance of the gospel. Have it in your prayer every day. Read Psalm 80. That's what the psalmist is doing. He's crying to God. We're going to have a, a, a prayer meeting for revival in a couple of weeks. Put it in your diary. Make it your business to say, I'm not very capable, Lord, but you are. Please be pleased not to pass us by. There's a place near the equator called the doldrums. Apparently it's where the air currents from the north and the south meet and in the days of sailing ships it was a terror because they could be stuck there for, for, for weeks on end. And I couldn't help thinking that just as those sailors were praying for wind to get the ships moving, you and I need to be praying for God's spirit to come and move us out of these present day doldrums. To move us so that we might become a mighty force. Oh, you say we're small, we're weak. We are. But God's not. He's well able to do exceedingly abundantly. Can you finish that verse? Above all that you ask, and I like how it now goes on, and imagine. God almost dares us to think big. For the non-believer, I have to say, you realise the privilege that you're having today of hearing the gospel? There are places in this country where people are no longer hearing it. They're in the shopping malls, they're in the sports stadium, they're on the ice rink. They're having a good, jolly time, but it's going to be a disaster. And if you're hearing the gospel through watching this video or listening, you need to realise what a privilege it is. And then to know that God holds you responsible for that privilege. Oh dear friend, it's time that you embrace this Christ. Let me get to the last point. Notice, he's not only preached among the Gentiles, he's believed on. And you notice how wide a range that is? The gospel was never meant to stay in the land of Israel. When Jesus promises the disciples or, or tells them to wait because the Holy Spirit is to be poured out, he tells them, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, I'm crossing, I'm putting words in there, right now, and even to the ends of the earth. You see, it was always God's plan. And the, the, the proof of that is the very fact that there's a church here at all. This gospel has been going from person to person. Down through the centuries. And gathering in God's people. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. And he goes on to say, doesn't he? And they follow. And they follow. So, so, so it becomes our, 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 our purpose in life. To make sure the word of God gets into the eyeballs of people. Into the earlobes of people. Or into the ears of people. Not the lobes. That's my business here below. To cry, behold, behold the Lamb. That's what determines whether I'm successful or a failure in life. Not how much I get in the bank. Not how good qualifications I manage to accrue. Not how big or small a family, because it's tradition, it's becoming a trend now to be small families, isn't it? To protect the environment. There's a specific crown mentioned in the Bible for those that win souls. Now again, don't let me frighten you. That doesn't mean that every one of you have to be buttonholing everybody. Get on your knees and pray for those you love and for those that you know are gifted to do it. And believe, you see, 
that as the word goes out, it will carry with it its own power, its own force, and it will do its own work. And let's be sure the gospel is about Jesus. It's not just live a better life, be a better person, enjoy yourself more. That's the context. God was manifest in the flesh. That's the message we preach. That's the story we tell. And we remind the world that he was received up into glory. The idea here is that the one who is received up was received up in the fulfillment of prophecy. But then prophecy goes on to tell us hundreds of times in the New Testament that he's coming back. And so in this, in this instruction for the church, you have encapsulated the very reason and purpose for our existence to make Jesus known. Whether it be Christmas time or any other time. We're all things to all men that we might by all means. Do you know how to finish that verse? Save some. 1 Corinthians 9, 22. Our great calling in life is to understand our great purpose. After Jesus had died and risen again and ascended to glory, writes one book, the number of his followers was 120, Acts 1.15. All that his followers had to offer was the story of a Galilean carpenter who had been crucified on a hilltop in Palestine as a criminal, and yet... Before 70 years had passed, that story had gone out to the ends of the earth and men and women of every nation and tongue had accepted this crucified Jesus as Saviour and Lord. My heart aches for a new day like that. I know too many people who are not going to heaven because they're not trusting Christ. I wish I had the grace, like Mr. Moody, to look out the window and weep. But while there may be no tears in my eyes, there are tears in my heart. When we think of the youngsters that have come through our church, when we think of our family members, we cannot, cannot be indifferent. One of the kids who used to come to our church and receive Bible and recite Bible verses was on, on Facebook this week being rude and vulgar. How can that happen? Because the enemy's taken him. Are you still praying for them all? Do you keep a prayer list? As long as there's breath, there's hope. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, I need to wind down. Jesus is working and waiting to return. <coughs> the call then is, are we working and looking for his return? Are we setting our goals and purpose with making him known, showing him forth? Before you can do that, you need to be seeing him for yourself. You need to be able to give a personal testimony to his love, his grace, and his mercy. Oh, if you're not in Christ this morning, I plead with you, come to him. Get to know him. He's waiting. I just want to introduce you and let you get on with the business of experiencing his grace. I'm not here to sell religion. I'm here to remind myself that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. The mystery that begins with the God-man, the Saviour God, the risen God, the ascended God, the God who saves. May God, by his grace, draw us out as those who have it as our life's purpose to make him known. Amen.